Lord, thank you for uh, oh, being able to meet here together tonight, Lord. And uh, we lift up this time. Humbly ask you to have your way, Lord. In Psalm 111, it says, Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. His work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He has given food to those who fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. He has declared to his people the power of his works. In giving them the heritage of the nations, the works of his hands are verity and justice, meaning they are sure and true. All his precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. He has sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Uh, Lord, thank you. And uh, have your way tonight amongst your people, Lord. All right, how are you guys doing tonight? Good, good. It's been, it's, it's been I'm doing all right. Um, been a while since I taught, I could tell, because I went, wow, I'm, a, I'm way out of order here. <laughs> so bear with me. Um, if you could, I'm some guy down the street. Um, if you could see the title, it would be, we're going to be in Colossians 1 tonight. Um, and the title of the message is, Have You Heard? Okay, so you can turn there. Since we've already read Psalm 111, we won't read that again, or I won't, <laughs> which you'll probably be thankful for. Um, but I can, I can start out because I'm not going to start out immediately in Colossians 1, but uh, the title, Have You Heard? Now, you're, you're probably asking yourselves, mm, have I heard what? Well, especially because of the political season and climate we've been in and are nearing the end, praise God. Um, we've heard many things, you know, uh, some true and some not, but, uh, we're not here for those political truths and untruths tonight. You know, although it needs to be said that the body of Christ should stay informed, um, of what the candidates stand for morally and ethically as it lines up with our faith in, uh, Jesus Christ and, and his word. So, you know, because we are to be that salt and light influence in our culture. And, uh, and we're to be that influence to a lost and dying world around us. So, salt is not only for flavor, as we know, but, you know, it's also a preservative. And, and it's used to help preserve meats. See, it doesn't stop the decaying process, but it slows it down. You know, it slows down that final stage of complete corruption. Um, which is uh, a good picture of where this world is heading right now into its final corruption stage. But um, it's also a good picture of how the church should work in the world. You know, we should be that salt that is slowing down that decay, decay uh, and corruption process. You know, as, uh, as we adhere to uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ and be that salt and light. So being in the last days, you know... Who knows if there might not be one more great revival um, and outpouring of the Holy Spirit on our country or, or, or on the world. We know our countries. I don't know about you guys, but I, I feel our country is free-falling straight to hell right now. It, it's not slipping anymore, and it's not sliding. It's in a free fall. So it's a good thing we have our faith and, and hope and trust placed in God. And his son, Jesus Christ, God the Son. So, but Matthew 5, 13 through 16, you know, Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. 
Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light, our light, shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You see, the body of Christ is called by the Lord, Jesus, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to be light. You know, to let his light shine through us, to be that kind of influence in our culture that brings God glory through how we live our lives unto Jesus. And that includes being a positive influence to, a, to family, friends, you know, and, and the world around us, especially during this election process. So, you know, Jesus' ministry was, was public, you know, and uh, so our light should shine in public. Um, Paul tells us in Romans 15, he says, We are to live our lives in such a way, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may, with one mind and one mouth, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what you'll find in Romans 15, 6. But it would do us well to go back to the beginning of that passage, starting in verse 4 of chapter 15. It says, and I know you've heard me say this probably almost every time I teach, but for whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before we move on into uh, Colossians 1, I want to go back to something uh, Zach Slater said last uh, Wednesday when he taught. And he said it several times. And he said, stay in the Word. You know, study the Word. And, and verse 4, you know, of Romans 15, which we just read, tells us that by staying in the Scriptures, that it is for our benefit. You know, by patiently studying the Scriptures, we learn of God. And he reveals himself to us, you know, his faithfulness. And then the only true place where we can find comfort and hope is in the scriptures, is, is, is through the Lord. So, and then uh, last but not least, lest we forget, um, 2 Timothy three sixteen and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, so like Slater said the other night, you know, we cannot express enough the importance for all of us to stay in the Word of God. You know, and, and so the Word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit can do His work in and through us. Amen? Amen. Yeah, I mean... I never get tired of, of, of Scripture. I mean, especially, especially that tells us, you know, that it brings us comfort. It brings us our hope. Um, it's all true. We know that. So, now, Colossians 1. Almost. So, let's set the scene to what's going on here. Paul is in Rome for the first time. But... He got there under Roman custody. Now, this is the condensed version, the Reader's Digest. He got there uh, under Roman custody because he had been testifying to the Jews in the temple in, in Jerusalem of Jesus Christ being the Messiah. And Jews wanted him dead. So, another long story short, the Romans arrested Paul, and the commander ordered him to be scourged, which is just uh, another quicker version of interrogation. So... But because of one of the many things Paul was, he had a dual citizenship. You know, not only was he 100% Jewish, but Acts 22, 25 through 28 tells us, And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, saying, Take care of what you do, for that man is a Roman. Then the commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? He said, Yes. 
The commander answered, With a large sum of money I obtained this citizenship. And Paul said, But I was born a citizen. See, in the Roman world, if you were a Roman, you had your rights. They couldn't do that. And if you were anybody else, well, so be it. But, uh, so now as we move on, we find out whose idea it really was for Paul to wind up in Roman custody. Acts 20, and, and move on to, uh, to Rome. Acts 23.11 states that while Paul was waiting in the Roman barracks, Verse 11 of Acts 23. But the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. So that's the condensed version of how Paul wound up in Rome to write uh, Colossians and uh, but I'll tell you this, for more excitement in Paul, read, read Paul's life starting at Acts 7. I mean, the Lord will truly show you, do a study. The Lord will truly show you great things in a study of the life of Paul. And, and I'll tell you what I'm going to do now. I, I probably shouldn't, but I'll take you to where the life of Paul starts in Acts 7. And that way you can just jump right into Acts 8. Okay? So that way we get kind of like a head start. But, uh, oh, by the way, if you're a new believer in Christ uh, and not familiar with the Apostle Paul before he accepted Jesus, his, uh, before he was uh, Apostle Paul, his name was Saul. Okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna, I'll start you out in 7 where Paul comes in. And then that way you just have to go to 8 afterwards. Um, Acts 7, 57 through 60. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, you can, if you want, you can skip chapter 7, but uh, I hope the Lord has put a desire in your heart to go back and, and, and get the rest of that story. So, so now Paul is in custody in Rome, under house arrest. And we're going to find out that the Lord has totally hooked up Paul in this house arrest, um, being under, you know, Roman imprisonment. Um, Acts 28, 30 through 31 says, Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. Now, I'll tell you what, if i got to go to prison... I think that's the way I'd like to go. But, uh, so now this much we know about Paul and Colossae. There is no proof that Paul had ever been there. And it's quite possible that um, this gentleman Epaphras founded the church there in Colossae, the Colossian church. Um, as to Paul's relationship with Epaphras, you know, we can see it mentioned in Philemon verse 123. And the reason I mentioned Philemon, Epaphras will see in Colossians, the book, the first chapter of Colossians, but when C Colossians and Philemon were written the same time. Colossians was written, and then Philemon was written, and both these letters were sent off. Because Colossians was sent to the church of Colossae, and Philemon was a uh, a citizen of Colossae. So that's the reason I, I'm bringing this up. But in Philemon, in Philemon we can see uh, the, Paul's relationship with Epaphras. And it says in 123 of Philemon, of Philemon, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, greets you. So as we see, Epaphras is just as much a prisoner as Paul, but they both recognize 
that they are prisoners of the Lord Jesus and not of Rome. So one of the things we do know from history was that false doctrines would follow the gospel message of Jesus Christ and the Christians in Colossae were now experiencing the same kinds of issues. Uh, Bible teacher David Guzik describes, which some have called it, it was called the Colossian heresy. And he describes it like this. He says, it's hard to exactly describe what those doctrines were. It seems like they were a corruption of Christianity with elements of mystical and legalistic Judaism, perhaps combined with early Gnosticism, which was a desire to get more and more knowledge because knowledge is key. The only knowledge that's key is the knowledge of the Lord, and the fear of the Lord is wisdom. So, you know, at these same, as these same things were going on then, we could, we could see them going on around us today. Only they've broadened their scope of lies today than what they had um, back then. You know, they, they tend to make it even more appealing to the flesh now um, in the false teachings. But I'm with Zach Slater. Stay in your Bible daily. You know, don't just read it, but study it. You know, because how can we ever know the difference when the counterfeit shows up if we've not handled the truth? You know, when, when people who handle large sums of money regularly, when they're trained, all they ever handle is real cash. They do not touch counterfeit cash. Everything they handle is real. So when the fake comes, they recognize it. Well, how about us? Are we handling the truth regularly? Are we in it, studying it? Are we taking notes? If not, when a weird wind of doctrine comes by, which it will, because it always does, if we're not trained in the truth, what's to keep us from going sideways and following after some strange doctrine? You know, how do we think we could escape from the trappings of the enemy? You know, Jesus said in, 10, in John 10.10, 10, He says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life, and they have it more abundantly. See, it's our choice. It's our choice daily to pick up the Word of God and pray and ask Him to reveal Himself to us. So, Colossians 1. Knew we'd get there. You were probably starting to wonder now, huh? <laughs> Number, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy our brother, to the saints and faithful, faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you, as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you, since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. So as Paul opens, we, we see the familiar Pauline greeting that is associated with Paul's letters. Paul states that it was only by the will of God that he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. And then he makes mention that Timothy, who was with him, who was not an apostle, but a companion of Paul's. You know, it's possible that Timothy is writing this letter. We don't know it, but it's possible. Um, well, Paul dictates it. You know, remember, Timothy was like a, a son to Paul. Paul was training him for the ministry because Timothy had a call on his life from the Lord. Now, as usual, Paul sends the Colossian church grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he mentions how they always give thanks and pray 
for the church because they had heard of their faith, hope, and love. Now, most certainly, Epaphras told Paul everything that was going on. But the takeaway for us here is, what do we do when we hear of another you know, brother or sister or fellowship that the Lord is using? Do we lift them up in prayer like Paul and those that were with him? Or do we think, cool, that's great. I'm, you know, I'm glad the Lord's using you guys. Yeah, see you later. You know, but uh, do we lift them up? Now, when I wrote this, I had to ask myself, you know, that question. Because Mary Ellen and I, when we're out of town on a Sunday or a midweek, we visit uh, a, a local fellowship in the area where we can get fed the word and, and then have some fellowship time. And honestly, when I thought about it, I couldn't say I lifted each one of those fellowships up in prayer. Um, but I do know that I will be more aware of that fact from now on. So we as a part of the body of Christ are to pray for one another. Paul here had never been to the Colossian church. He'd never been to Colossae. And in reality, they truly were quite small in size. They were pretty insignificant. But uh, Paul made it a priority to pray for them. And thanked God for them. Why? Well, Paul noticed three things in these believers. One was their faith in Jesus Christ. Second was their love for all the saints. And last was their future, was, was that their hope was laid up in heaven. Paul recognized through, through talking with Epaphras, this was a, this was a godly church. They, they were taught the word properly. And needed prayer. Well, well, Paul wrote them this letter as an encouragement for them to continue on in the truth of the gospel. The gospel message that Epaphras had taught them. And, and then they had also heard word around them that uh, there was fruits from their labors. You know, they were showing up. People were talking about the fruits from this church of uh, Colossae. And... Uh, that happens everywhere that the gospel message of Jesus is being preached. Fruits happen. When we take the time to pray for others, especially when we are present with them, either individually or, or as a couple or a group, not only is it an encouragement for them, but there is something about it, I think, that, that I or we or uh, as a group, we get more blessed than those we just prayed for. I sense that a lot. We tend to pray for a lot of people. And, and, and I've learned over the years, learned a long time ago that, you know, it's, uh, years ago I used to, yeah, I'll pray for you. You know what? And I didn't. And I got busted one day in somebody's uh, teaching, you know. It says, it might have been Jack Hibbs. But he said, you know, when you say you're going to pray for somebody and you don't, that's a sin. And I was like, Oh, my. You know, I had that Christianese down to a science. Oh, yeah, brother, I'll pray for you. That was the last I ever thought about that person. So because of that message, I thought, you know what? In order to keep from sinning like that, how about we pray right now? And it's just become a habit, and it's been a wonderful thing. Like I said, I think I, think I or Mary Ellen and I, or as a group, when we pray as a group for people, I really believe we get more blessed. But uh, not only that... When we pray, that is the one way to do battle in the spiritual realm. And all of this for the glory of God. It's not for our glory, but it brings glory to our Father in heaven. Look at verse 9. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, Paul gives them the specifics of how they are praying for them. And th that they would be filled with knowledge, wisdom, and spiritual understanding according to God's will. You know, as we study God's word, we, we can know his will for us. And, and have wisdom and spiritual understanding also. 
you know, to, and to be able to have that spiritual guard around us from false teachings you know, that try to lead us astray. But wait, there's more. Not only in His Word can we have these things, but also in outside circumstances around us. As born-again believers in Jesus Christ, what do we know? Well, we know that we have been given the free gift of salvation, right? But what else? We are filled with the Holy Spirit of God, which is essential to our walk. How often when we pray do we ask to be led by the Holy Spirit, taught by the Holy Spirit, and filled afresh by the Holy Spirit? You know, in the book of John, Jesus tells the disciples what the role of the Holy Spirit will be. But not only the disciples, but for us also. Because remember Romans 15, 4? For whatever things were written before were written for our learning. So Jesus gives his disciples the Holy Spirit's role in, in verses in, in John 14. And Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And that's John 14, 16, and 17. In another verse, John 14, 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. How does that work for us? This whole book is about Jesus. So anything we read in there, the Holy Spirit can bring to our remembrance, and it's about Christ. In another verse, However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you of things to come. He will glorify Me, for He will take of what is Mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. And that's in John 16, verses 13 through 15. But remember when I said we can receive that help in outside circumstances? We can find that in Mark 13, 11. Jesus said, but when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given to you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speaks, but the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not limited because the Holy Spirit is God also. God is not limited. Acts 1.8 just before Jesus ascended into heaven, he is telling the disciples, he told them, he says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. In 2 Peter 1, verses 2 and 3, Peter says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. So now what have you heard? We've heard that if there is anything lacking in our life, it's not because of God. We just read in, in, in 2 Peter, God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So we're lacking it if we're not in this daily. These being the last days, I don't see how anybody could not be in this. This gives us all instruction. Verse 10, Colossians 1, where we started. <laughs> that you may walk worthy of the Lord, 
fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to His glorious power, for all patience and long-suffering with joy. Remember, Paul was, was telling them how he was praying for them, praying for this uh, little church in Colossae. Now, that's a way to pray for other brothers and sisters. You know, yes, we want you to be able to walk worthy as being strengthened in the Lord. What a great thing for every believer. We're, we might be different fellowships, but if they're born-again Bible-believing, Bible-teaching churches, they're just another part of the body of Christ. We're all on the same team. Or we should be. You know, we should be praying those for other brothers and sisters, that they walk worthy and strengthen in the Lord with a desire to please Him. We should be praying that for ourselves. And that uh, through those things, the good works happen. We don't make them happen. The Lord des designs those situations where good works flow for His glory. And... Uh, you know, the, the fruit of those works should, should or would be evident to all and for God's glory. But, but wait, there's more. Like an infomercial. You know, Paul says, not only the knowledge of His will that we prayed before for you earlier, but we want to increase that even more. Saying, yeah, that, that knowledge of His will is great, but Lord, increase that knowledge of your will to them. You know, that's, that's awesome. How many want Paul and his team praying for them? I do. Well, think about it. How much are we praying for others? Something to think about. You know, two weeks ago, um, I was extremely humbled. We were watching the Wednesday night live stream, and Pastor Ray was teaching, and, and, and he said that he was fasting for me, for whatever was, is going on with my health. Now, if that's not humbling enough, you know, I asked Mary Ellen, you know, at the end, I, I asked her to grab my phone and, and text him, you know, for me to, uh, that uh, after service and, and thank him for me. And then he texted me back and, and he said that a few others had come up and told him that they were also fasting for me. I was like, oh, wow. I mean, that humbled me that much more. Because I can honestly say I haven't fasted for anybody. I pray for people, but I haven't fasted for anybody. It was hum very humbling. And I want to thank everybody for that, your prayers and fasting. So now we find Paul in verse 12 giving thanks again. Verse 12, Colossians 1 giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. So Paul is giving all glory to God because it's the Father who has made us sufficient. It was the, it's the Father who has equipped us to have a share in eternal salvation with the rest of the born-again believers in Jesus. Now, God has rescued us from Satan's power of darkness and domain, whereupon the Father has transferred us into His kingdom, who He given charge to His Son who paid the redemption or ransom price for our sins so we could be forgiven by the shedding of Jesus' blood. So we no longer have that barrier between us and the Father. You know, if we take note of Matthew chapter 27, verse 50, 51, 50 and 51, it says, And Jesus cried out with a, again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. 
Notice that that barrier that was between us, that veil of the temple in heaven, was torn in two. Take notice that the veil was separated. You know, take notice. The veil, what, was sep- what, what separated the holy place from the most holy place in the temple, you know, it was a vivid demonstration of the separation between God and man. And notably, the veil was torn from the top to the bottom. And it was God the Father who did the tearing. So God the Father has done all this because of His Son Jesus, God the Son. He has set us up in these places. You know, verse 15, of, in, in continuing on in Colossians, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. And He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell, and by Him to reconcile all things to Himself, By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Well, that's pretty clear, right? You all got it? Yeah, I read it several times. But Paul explains here, he says, he's explaining how Jesus is the mirror image of God the Father, the invisible God. Well, Jesus is the mirror image of the invisible God, which making Jesus God also. Meaning the only way to know God the Father is through God the Son. You know, Bible scholar and commentator Arthur Samuel Peake, he was born in 1865 and died in 1929, he explains it this way. He says, God is invisible, which does not merely mean that he cannot be seen by our bodily eye but that he is unknowable. But in the exalted Christ, the unknowable God becomes known. That goes along with the answer that that Jesus gave Philip in John 14, verses 8 through 9. Jesus said, it, it says, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. The mirror image of the unknowable God can be known through his Son, Jesus Christ. So all the awesomeness of God can be seen in his awesome Son, Jesus Paul continues to explain that Jesus is the creator of all things. Everything that can be seen and things that exist that are invisible to the naked eye. They were created by by Jesus. Jesus is the creator of all things, including principalities and powers. Not Not only the angels in heaven, but also all those who left heaven all answer to God to our God and Savior, King Jesus. They might have left heaven, they followed Satan, but they still answer to God the Son. Here's here's something that I came across and I thought it was interesting, talking about things that were invisible to the naked eye. These were, I thought, were pretty neat little tidbits. Comets... Everybody knows what a comet is. Comets have vapor trails up to 10,000 miles long. 
if you could capture all that vapor and put it in a bottle, the amount of vapor actually present in that bottle would take up less than one cubic inch of space. That's our creator. He's awesome. If the sun were the size of a beach ball and put on top of the Empire State Building, the nearest group of stars would be as far away as Australia is to the Empire State Building. That's our Creator. That's our God. That's Jesus. He knows how to make things. The earth travels around the sun about eight times the speed of a bullet fired from a gun. And yet everything is held in perfect order by Creator God, the sun. I read that and I was thinking, wow, I haven't felt it. God doesn't make junk. There are more insects in one square mile of rural land. Oh, most of you women will love this part. There are more insects in one square mile of rural land than there are human beings on the entire earth. Let's go camping. <laughs> Bees make their own air conditioning. When the weather gets hot and threatens to melt the wax in the hive, one group of bees will go to the entrance of the hive and another will stay inside. They will then flap their wings all together, making a cross draft that pulls the hot air out of the hive and draws cooler air inside. A single human chromosome contains... 20 billion bits of information. How much information is that? If written in ordinary books, in ordinary language, it would take about 4,000 volumes. No, not evolution. God. Jesus did not use evolution when he created all things. Jesus, God the Son, is the beginning of and has always existed with God the Father. And Jesus is the head of the church, as, as Paul was saying. You know, he is the head of the church, the born-again body of believers. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says, And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, I don't know if you've, picked up on this yet, but when I teach, I use the term born again a lot. And the reason being is John 3.3. 3. Jesus answered and said to him, this was, uh, well, I'll get to it, it's, I wrote it afterwards. John 3.3, 3, Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus said this to Nicodemus, one of the Jewish leaders who came to him at night. And, and Jesus tells Nick, he says, Dude, if you're not born again, I don't think Jesus really said, Dude, that's just, you know. But uh, if, if you're, he says, If you're not born again, you won't even be able to perceive the kingdom of God. And then in verse 1, or verse 5, he, he now tells Nick, He says, You are born of your mother, but unless you are born, Unless you or anyone else, you know, if you're not born again by the work of the Holy Spirit, you or they will not enter the kingdom of God. I can't believe I didn't put that verse down. Let me, let me flip over there real quick. If you want to, John uh, 3, 5. Wow, how did I do that? Proofreading is a wonderful thing. I usually run out of time for that. But, uh, see, in, in 3, 3, he says... Unless you're born again, you won't even be able to see the kingdom of God. You'll never perceive it. It's not going to happen. But in verse 5, Jesus continued on to Nick. And he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's why I like born again. The reason I mention this is because maybe you heard somebody Yes, and it's usually somebody who calls themselves a Christian. Maybe they were talking with some others about 
about those people that they call themselves born again. Or, or, or if you've experienced even personally talking with somebody. You know? Um, well, in my experience, and I've experienced a number of times, people talk about, oh, you're one of them born againers. You know? Um, it, it's usually with a negative connotation. You know? Do we all see the problem with that, with that attitude after looking at John 3 3 and, and John 3 5? We just heard the words of Jesus. God the Son, the creator of all things, tell Nicodemus, who was a member of the Sanhedrin, that unless he or any el- anyone else was born again, they would not enter the kingdom of God. So now we've heard. And if, it, and if, it, if that happens to any of us again, or, or for the first time, we can lovingly point these people out, you know, point out to them John 3. You know, we, we can read the words of Jesus to them. We can do it in love. And, and, and maybe because I, I think what happens is a lot of people are full of religion. I know they are. I know I used to be. Now I'm just full of malarkey. So. And the Holy Spirit. Woo! Yeah. So, verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on the earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Now that word fullness, for it pleased the Father in him that all the fullness should dwell, that word fullness comes from a Greek word that truly means Jesus is God. And, and the, the word dwell carries the meaning of permanent or permanently because in our society, we can say, well, you know, I, I, I dwelt in that house for a while. You know, I dwelt, we move around. But in, in this Greek term, this, this word dwell carries the meaning of a permanent thing. Jesus is God. Fullness comes from a Greek word. That means Jesus is God, and it is permanent. Always has been, always will be. Now, because of the shed blood of Jesus, the former state of harmony that existed before Adam and Eve's sin in, in the garden, that former state is reality again. That's awesome. Verse 21. And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now we were all alienated from God. And that word alienated means transferred to another owner. Because of the sin in the garden, that's what happened to each and every one of us. We became citizens of Satan's realm. And, and very self-centered. But Jesus paid the cost for us. Which none of us could pay. And because only God could pay that price, Jesus, 100% God, and 100% man, and 100% without sin... He willfully went to the cross and paid the debt for all mankind. Paul tells them that as long as they, and also we, us, as long as we continue in the faith, as long as we keep ourselves grounded and stable, firm and immovable, and we don't... We don't move ourselves out of that position of joyful and confident expectation of eternal salvation found only in the truth of the gospel which you heard, which they heard, which we have heard tonight. You know, and this is the same gospel message that Paul says, that I, I, Paul, being an apostle of Jesus Christ, as appointed by God the Father, preach everywhere I go. Verse 24. I now, 
Rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ, for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. The mystery which has now been revealed to his saints. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Now, I didn't prepare... written notes on that part because I was running out of time but we know that up until the point when Jesus came the gospel was was hidden and the old saints wanted to know what it was like but it was now revealed you know and we know that uh, God willed to make known what are the riches of his glory to this mystery among the Gentiles. See, it wasn't just the Jews that God wanted saved. God knew all along how all this was going to play out because God knows all things. And he wanted everybody to be saved. We know that everybody won't be. But that doesn't mean we give up on sharing the gospel to those around us. You know, And we know that we have the hope of glory, you know, the, the hope of glory, and we know that we're filled with the Holy Spirit. But another thing I want to do is give you all homework, six verses. Study it, it's good. But so so what have we heard? Well, we heard about a church that was founded on the gospel of Christ Jesus. We heard about that false heard about that false teachings and false doctrines were starting to make their way into Colossae, which is devastating for any fellowship. That is not taught the truth of the gospel over and over and over again repeatedly. You know, that's, that's why we study. Because the word of God is living and active and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. What God might show us one thing this week, two years later when we're back in that same, same passage, he might show us a different aspect of that. The word of God is living and active. So... We heard how the Apostle Paul responded. You know, how did he respond? With encouragement. And with the truth of the deity of Jesus Christ. And he being God the Son. How God the Son was the mirror image of God the Father. And how Jesus was the creator of all things. Paul gave them the truth. He gave them the gospel boldly. What an encouragement. They had already heard the truth and knew the truth from Epaphras. And here, Paul, who has never been there, takes time and goes over it all again. What an encouragement. We all need that encouragement. That's why we come on a Wednesday night. That's why we come on a Sunday. That's why we go to men's studies and women's studies and men's breakfast and this, that, and the other thing. Yeah, the, 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 the meals and all that, but it's the fellowship. It's, it's the clanking of swords, sharpening each other's swords. You know, getting deeper into the Word. You try that in the Word, in the world, they'll stab you with your own sword. Now, we, we're supposed to have each other's backs. We're supposed to wash each other's feet. So that is what we heard. And, and, and we should be able to encourage and pray for those around us. Even if, and especially if they are not believers. We should be able to lead someone to Christ because as born-again believers, we are filled with the Holy Spirit who gives us the power to do so. And, and that's what we heard and we know. Amen? Amen brother. All right. Father, we uh, thank you, Lord, for, for your word that is truth. Lord, and, uh, I pray that... Uh, 
all the chaff that uh, came from me tonight, Lord, would be just blown away. Lord, that your word and your truth would be just embedded in each of our hearts and our minds, Lord, that would uh, transform our minds like Romans 12, Lord, that your word would transform our minds. God, we thank you. We love you. Lord, give us a boldness through your son, Jesus, in the power of your Holy Spirit to encourage those around us, Lord, to take more time to pray for those, even if they don't know you. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And we lift this up in Jesus' precious name. Amen. No, no.